Right, welcome back to our continuing series of Lowdown on the Lockdown. Um, this week, Nessa, Dean, Eddie and I are, are joined by another couple of experts. We're going to have Professor Cordia Geiringer talk to us in a minute about some recent litigation, but more importantly, some proposed litigation. And then we're going to talk with Yvette and Nessa about um, some of the criminal justice aspects of the lockdown, which we haven't had enough time to focus on so far. But what I wanted to do was to start with um, to start with Claudia and, and Dean, and particularly just get Dean to do a bit of a scene set, perhaps, on what's been happening in the courts, because quite excitingly, there's been a lot happening. Dean, as I said on Twitter, went where no lawyer could go into the bowels of the Court of Appeal to watch the hearing in a against the Director General. So, um, Dean. Yeah, uh, we, we talked about um, this case as the habeas corpus application to um, challenge the validity of the so-called or the alleged detention under the orders. High Court had, 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 had tossed, it, tossed it out. Um, but on Friday afternoon, uh, the Court of Appeal um, heard the appeal. And as Jeff said, I wandered down with my bowl of popcorn and I'd been granted permission to attend and sit in the gallery and, and quite exciting for me, my first time officially sanctioned to do live tweeting from the back of a courtroom. Um, and we had a couple of judges, the, the President and Justice Collins and the uh, sitting in the Court of Appeal in Molesworth Street and Justice French coming in from uh, along the wires from Christchurch, uh, Council from Crown Law on the, um, on the audio video link and, and two litigants in person uh, also coming in remotely. And um, we always said, you know, it's a curious case for habeas corpus, it was always going to be doomed because the applicants um, had to uh, prove they were um, detained. But just to, uh, and I think to recap for people that haven't heard of habeas corpus and listened to our exciting episode last week, habeas corpus is a writ that's filed by people who are detained against the person who is detaining them to say that there is no legal reason for them to be detained. And they should be released. And there's a particular procedure in a, a special statute now that requires the courts to give to expedite those hearings and sets out some procedural rules for those hearings. Yeah, that, 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 that's right, Jeff. And it, and it was always going to... Uh, well, the first question, I think, from the president to the, to the applicant is, have you been outside to exercise? Have you been down to the supermarket? And they asked the uh, other applicant as well, and they said, yeah, 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 of course. And then, unsurprisingly, the court ruled they weren't actually detained. And what that means and why that's significant is, is, is they didn't really need to get to and didn't get to that question of whether the <coughs> orders detain, so, uh, purportedly detaining them were um, valid or um, invalid. But I think the interesting thing to fill the gap from last time when we looked, talked about the High Court was um, the court was a lot more interested in that question of legality. They said it was unresolved, complex set of legal issues. And quite frankly, the eyebrow, eyebrows were raised on the point. And, and um, uh, uh, what they also <coughs> emphasised was, you know, this old writ of habeas corpus, you know, ex, um, special procedure and so forth, just wasn't, was too clunky to try and test the legal issue and very much said judicial review proceedings um, uh, would be much more proper to test those sort of legality questions. And, and indeed, they went as far as saying to the, you know, sort of um, uh, sussing out with the Crown whether the Crown would be prepared to help any such proceedings be expedited. And initially, the, count, uh, the Crown lawyers were a little bit shy to uh, leap on that invitation, but the judges nearly jumped out of their chairs at that and said, of course, you know, you, 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 the Crown would help that type of challenge be ex expedited. So um, it, that, that's the takeaway from, 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 from the, the appeal courts, but I think more to come on legality. So that brings really into what Claude is going to talk to us about, which is the proceeding that was filed after the Friday hearing in, in the in the Adun, the A against Adun case. So could you just want to tell us what's got, what that case alleges or what its basis is and what you think about it or what you think we should be interested about it? Yeah, so, so this, is, this is really interesting um, because this is exactly the sort of case the Court of Appeal were anticipating. It's a judicial review 
of the lawfulness of the various orders made by the Director General under Section 70 of the Health Act. And I know you've discussed these orders a little bit on, in previous weeks, but these orders are, are essentially the key legal mechanism by which the lockdown has been effected, by which the precise rules that apply to what we're all allowed to do or not allowed to do under the lockdown um, at each level of the lockdown have been specified. And we can come back um, to the detail of what's been alleged in a minute, but just a couple of interesting background points to note. The first is that um, A and B, the litigants in the case that Dean has talked about, um, were, they were lay litigants and they picked the wrong legal process and then they made all sorts of far-fetched and distracting allegations of bad faith against the Prime Minister and the Director General. So, so just and, before Clinic Hoodie goes on, just to, to recap, one of those allegations was in fact that the Prime Minister was in cahoots with a leading businessman to ruin the New Zealand economy, which seemed to be rather an odd allegation. Right. And, and, and I think that's a really important point of contrast because what we have in this case is another lay litigant. He's not, at least at this stage, he doesn't have legal representation. But the plaintiff, Andrew Borrowdale, is a legislative drafter, so formally employed by the Parliamentary Council's office. Um, so someone with experience in um, reading statutes, he, um, he's put together a very streamlined and perfectly credible challenge to the Section 70 orders. And interestingly, he's restricted his challenge to arguments that just focus on the meaning of the empowering provisions under which these orders have been made. In other words, his case is entirely one of statutory interpretation. Did the empowering provisions in fact authorise mm -hmm. the orders that were made? And so he hasn't, at least on the face of the claim, argued that the orders amount to a disproportionate um, limit on our rights and freedoms under the Bill of Rights. And he hasn't strayed into the question that I know has been discussed in previous podcasts about whether the Director General may have taken too much direction from Cabinet in issuing these orders and therefore failed to act sufficiently independently. And I actually think that that issue is a really interesting one, but the beauty of restricting the case to these fairly confined issues of statutory interpretation is that the Crown won't be able to argue that they need to mount a great deal of complex evidence to respond to the case. And that means realistically it could, could come on very quickly for a hearing. So I think that's really interesting. I think there's also an interesting question about whether he might apply to have the case moved into the Court of Appeal because there's a provision in the Senior Courts Act that allows civil proceedings in exceptional circumstances to be heard at first instance by the Court of Appeal. And I think this probably is such an exceptional case. And my bet would be that if an application was made, it would be granted. Even if, and this is something just to think about, what I've been thinking about is even if by the time this comes on, we have all moved away from the current restrictions into the new world of level two, which is quite likely to happen next week or at least the week after. We're not sure how quickly it comes on and the, what the Court of Appeal meant by expedited, whether there'll be a hearing next week, but it's quite likely that these rules will have changed quite su substantially by the time Mr. Burrowdale's case gets heard. Yeah, I guess it depends when, when we get level two, because I know that the um, Crown's been uh, directed to file a statement of defence by Monday. So it is moving quite fast, but it, one couldn't see it um, being set down for a hearing before at least late next week. So, yeah, that's right. And, and mootness, if, if we have moved on, um, the court may dodge the whole issue. That, that would be, you know, a, 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 a choice for the court, whether it wants to look at the issue at all. Yeah, so mootness just for the... The non-legal train spotters, if we have any left it's after three and a half weeks of legal train spotting, mootness is a doctrine where courts can say, well, there just is no live legal issue here anymore. Whether that would actually be true, because we don't know on what basis the government is going to make the new orders yet. The legislative, back, the legislative infill hasn't really been provided to us yet, as far as I've, I've heard. We're still waiting to hear what that will be, so we're not quite sure what will be next. Um, so one of the things that happened in between Sorry, one thing that, that happened before the Adurn Court of Appeal hearing and then the Burrowdale filing was your blog with our colleague Andrew Geddes, who's a professor at Otago. Just want to talk a little bit about 
what you said or what was interesting perhaps for people to hear about what you said or what you might have liked to elaborate on what you said with that, with Andrew. Yeah, sure. Well, maybe I can pick up on the points that are sort of in common between what we were saying and what has been picked up in this case and what's going to be now litigated by the court because <coughs> The, so the, the case sort of challenges challenges three orders made by the Director General. The first one was made under Section 71M of the Act, and that related to closure of premises and congregating in outdoor places. But then um, the, the other two that he's challenging were what we might call the stay-at-home stay orders. Um, and the first one relating to the Level 4 lockdown and the second relating to the Level 3 lockdown. And they, they were made under Section 71F of the Act. And I don't think we should write off any of those challenges, but I think probably the strongest legal arguments um, and the one with the most wind behind them relate to the two orders made under Section 71F. So let me just take a little bit more of a deep dive into that. So the key argument, uh, which I know you've touched on um, previously, is that the authorising section only contemplates directions to specified individuals rather than to the community. So the order, the orders that have been made claim authority from a clause in the Health Act, this is section 71F, that says that in an epidemic, a medical officer of health can require persons to be isolated, quarantined or disinfected. And it also says that as long as he or she has the appropriate public health qualifications, the Director General of Health can exercise those powers of a medical officer of health. So on its face, you might say, okay, well, the section says that the Director General can require all persons to be isolated. So fair enough, he can say that all persons must be isolated. He can put the whole community into isolation, which is effectively what he's done. But when you start to look a bit more closely at the provision, there are some contextual factors that suggest that might not really be what the clause intended. And the two that I want to point out is, firstly, this is a power given to medical officers of health. So essentially doctors around the country who've been appointed because of their public health experience to help manage infectious diseases. And how extraordinary for a power to put the whole community into lockdown to be reposed in a medical practitioner with no legislative requirement that they consult with anyone in the making of the decision. So if that reading of the Act is correct, then three days after Cabinet purports to put us into Level 2, the Medical Officer of Health for any health district in the country could decide to put their district back into lockdown. So that's one point. The second, which I think is quite strong, is the contrast between Sections 71F, the one we're talking about now, and 71M. So Section 71M is the other provision the Director General has relied on in order to close premises and prohibit congregating in public places. And the section says he can do that, and the way he does it is, quote, by order published in a newspaper circulating in the health district or by announcement broadcast by a television channel or radio station that can be received by most households in the health district. So in other words, um, another clause in section 70 contemplates directions made to the community at large, it calls them orders, and it contains a requirement that they be properly published or communicated to the community in order to be given effect. And that seems entirely proper for an order that's to apply to the community at large as opposed to named individuals. And it seems surprising to say the least that if Section 71F were to allow broad-based community orders, it would not similarly make provision for public dissemination. So those, I think, are the key arguments. Now, to be clear, they're not slam dunks. There are some contextual arguments that go the other way, and I'm sure the Crown will also be trawling the legislative history, which is quite um, complicated. But in my view, these arguments are quite strong. And what gives them their real teeth is the principle of legality, which is the common law presumption that if rights and freedoms are taken away, that is done in the clearest possible legislative language. Well, what we have here is one of the most significant intrusions on our civil liberties in a century. And it seems to me that it isn't the clearest possible legislative language. And I think that that may turn out to be a problem for the Crown, depending on how differential the judges choose to be. But especially now that we're coming out of the lockdown, judges may be less inclined to 
give the Crown the benefit of the doubt than they might have been a few weeks ago. Yes, so as I understand it, the problem with the statutes really is that they all seem a bit ill-fitting. And the question then is, how did the court go about dealing with the ill-fittingness, which is going to be confronted with? So it's pretty clear to me, at least, that when the Health Act 1956 was passed, they weren't thinking necessarily the problems that we've been confronted for the last three or four weeks or five or six weeks. And that that's quite a normal problem in statutory interpretation. And judges often really had to take a what you might term and we could might term an ambulatory approach or some kind of purposive approach, which basically papers over the cracks of the language that were chosen all those decades ago to deal with a current problem. So my supposition has always been we have an act to deal with typhoid, maybe an act that deals with measles, but doesn't really deal very well with COVID-19. So I just wonder, how does that stack up this normal approach, which I see all the time in statutory interpretation cases, that judges are papering over the cracks of old statutes, because that's what they do, fit with the principle of legality. Yeah, I, I, I think, you're, I mean, that, that is the question. I think you're absolutely right that what we have is a very ill-fitting statute. It's interesting because Section 70, of course, was revised in 2006, and at that time they had bird flu in mind. I don't know um, why they didn't think bird flu might need this kind of response, but I guess it, it, it was a different, it had a different profile. They were also thinking about swine flu that they'd, you know, um, they'd also had to cope with. Well, 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 contemplated having to cope with. But um, I think your point about the ill-fitting statute, the real point, which I think we all agree on, is that there's a, there's, you know, Cabinet ought to be making these decisions. Cabinet um, is, is, is the entity that is best placed to decide this very complicated and multifaceted question about with, what restrictions should be placed on us, which has, doesn't just have health dimensions, it has huge economic dimensions and many other dimensions. But the statute just simply doesn't provide for that at all. And I think the sort of um, surgery that you're contemplating that, that needs to be done on the statute in order to turn it into the regime that allows Cabinet to make these decisions um, and to, to put the community into lockdown in this way is quite extensive. And to me, the principle of legality may create a problem for that, but you can certainly see why a court might be might be wanting to do the sort of surgery that you're contemplating. Yeah, it's a question of, because I think they do this sort of surgery more often than we often give them credit for, because statutes are words, and words always need to be given meaning by people that read them in particular contexts. But I agree, I think that this is going to be a really interesting thing to watch. The argument's going to be really interesting. Hopefully Dean gets some rights of tweeting so we can follow exactly what's going on in the court. I think these are really intricate article, um, arguments and it's going to be really interesting to see how the Crown puts together their defence and what, and indeed what they answer when they're asked, I'm sure they will be by the judges, why didn't Parliament just pass a flipping statute? Mm. Because after all, in the legislative, in the first sitting of the Epidemic Committee that I watched, the some bridges asked the, police, the then commissioner of police, what powers do you need? And we will give them to you. Um, so I think that's going to be an interesting question. I'm not sure whether you have a quick answer that you think the Crown might give or why you think the Crown hasn't passed a statute. Um, this seems to be an issue in the UK at the moment. Exactly, academics are asking exactly the same question. Why do you think Parliament might, the government might have been so reluctant to do what would have been quite an easy thing to have done perhaps? I have no idea, and I think it was very bad judgment because I think at some point they're going to have to anyway, and it's but now they've got a really big mess on their hands. I wonder, um, firstly, whether very you know to start with they were just they had so much going on they were overwhelmed and they put us into lockdown without even making an adequate order for that first week, and after that legislation at any point would have drawn attention to the pro the problems early on. So that could be part of the answer, or it could simply be that they have too much on their hands. They have so many regulatory challenges right now. Um, this, this seemed to be working out all right for them and maybe they just thought they'd get away with it. Or maybe their legal advice is very different from mine. Which we'll all find out. I suspect we'll find out a lot more about that, that legal advice. Um, and in fact, that just brings on Dean. Because um, one of the really interesting and quite extraordinary things that happened yesterday was a summons issued to the Solicitor General um, asking for the Crown's legal advice about the the lockdown, 
do you want to just quickly, very quickly, Dean, talk about that and what the issues are in play there? Because I think this is actually a significant constitutional moment in New Zealand. Yeah, it, it, it's significant in a couple of ways. The first way is that the the the, the, the sort of the roundabout way that the the, the opposition are trying to get to this le legality issue, because the the committee can ask the um, or press the government on what their found legal foundation for making the uh, going down the legal path that they wanted uh, they went down was. So they're trying to get that advice. So they've actually summons. The, the copies of the advice. I mean, I, I should say the Attorney General, when he appeared a couple of weeks ago, actually said, "Yo, we're using this power. It's simple and straightforward. We think it's fine." So actually, I don't think the legal advice will be actually um, necessarily that illuminate. It's not a complex legal argument. It's one on which we we can debate and and, and have debated. Um, but there's a confidence of the government that it works. The the constitutional issue really about the well, whether it's proper for um, the a select committee to request the Crown's legal advice, normally protected under legal pro professional privilege, and, and a question mark, and, and apparently hasn't been dealt with before, about whether a select committee can go behind and pierce that legal professional privilege and see the Crown's legal advice. And there's some real problems in, in, in opening up the, the, the government to, uh, or the executive, to have to offer up their, their legal advice. Um, uh, because sometimes that privacy and that candidness is often important and also might prejudice the Crown in legal proceedings later on, like the Borrowdale one, if they have to disclose it. So um, uh, we're not sure what's... I think the deadline's next week and we'll be watching it um, for the, the, the legal advice to be provided. I suspect the Crown will be very cautious and, and decline. And it may be the Privileges Committee that has to resolve whether the refusal amounts to contempt of Parliament or whether there's a proper basis for that. So that, for me, is one of the things to watch um, next week. Um, if I can add just one thing on where this legality thing is happening also in terms of um, parliamentary proceedings, we talked about the Regulations Review Committee writing to the Director General about the orders and raising some clarity issues, but also this question of, is the authorize, does the, uh, the uh, statute authorise these orders? Um, uh, and that was in relation to level four orders that we're aware um, from questions of the Epidemic Response Committee and also OIA that I've had in that there's a second letter. There's continuing discussions and that one's going to be released shortly. And I suspect that might be in relation to level three orders. Um, but we'll see a little bit more of that. I think probably the end of this week, maybe early next week. Yeah, because one of the extraordinary things was not only that the Court of Appeal referred to Claudia and Andrew's blog piece, but they also referred to the Regulations Review Committee letter to the Select Committee, which I found, to, to the Minister, to the Direct General, sorry, which I found really interesting because I'm not entirely sure that those letters are meant for courts and they're not entirely meant. In fact, just looking at Claudia, she would say there's actually a statute of Parliament, the Parliamentary Privileges Act, which probably purports to prevent that kind of use of that material. Um, but we don't really have time to dwell too much on that. Maybe in another episode when there's a little less happening. Just quickly, Eddie, we've been talking about cases that have been bought and lost and cases that are going to be bought, but there has been a case where the Crown has actually lost in the lockdown. So I want to quickly tell us about Mr. Christensen's case, why he won, and then perhaps just to talk a little bit about what this means for accountability in New Zealand. Yes, yeah, so uh, Mr. Christensen, Oliver Christensen, uh, it's it's this is about people asking for compassionate exemptions from the quarantine requirements to quarantine for two weeks when you come back into the country and because it's about compassionate exceptions all of these are pretty sad stories and and mr christensen's is quite sad he rushed back to new zealand when he found out uh, that his father was very ill and was fading faster than expected uh, and then when he got back and properly went into quarantine, discovered that things were going even faster than he thought. So if he wanted to see his father, he would need to see him before the end of his quarantine period. So he applied for an exemption, a compassionate exemption to quarantine, uh, and was turned down, uh, applied again two more times, including emailing the Director General of Health and the Health Minister directly, and, and got no luck, uh, and eventually ended up filing a judicial review. 
And the basis of his judicial review was that there are rules set out in one of these Health Act orders that we've been talking about that say when uh, a compassionate exemption can be given or an exemption to quarantine can be given. And it lists a couple of conditions where exceptional circumstances or compassionate consideration uh, can be considered, but it also talks about criteria put on the ministry's web, uh, COVID-19 website and, and that those will be applied. And what it turned out had happened is that the Ministry of Health officials had only been applying those rules on the website. They hadn't been looking at these specific categories for exceptional circumstances that the actual law set out. And this kind of ties back into the stuff that uh, Claudia was talking about, is that government officials must exercise their power according to what the law says. Um, they are empowered by the law and they can only act um, to restrict our rights or to um, control our movements according to what the law says. And they had been applying the wrong test because they applied this list on the website that didn't include compassionate exceptions. And so the judge said, you have got the law wrong here. You have not applied your discretion because this is a discretionary decision. They're supposed to think about the individual circumstances and if they should depart from the normal rules. That's what a discretion is. You haven't done that. Instead, you've mechanically applied these criteria off the website that aren't even really the law. Uh, and so the decision was struck down, and this is quite unusual. Not only um, did they say, you got this decision wrong, uh, but the judge ordered the Ministry of Health to let Mr. Christensen go and see his father. And interestingly enough, the, <clears throat> the Prime Minister responded to this, and first of all, she was given the wrong statistics because she thought there had been more compassionate appeals that in fact there had been. In fact, at the time she gave her had press conference, there had been no compassionate appeals granted. Um, but interestingly enough, what she did as a result of the appeal of the judicial review was that she then instructed a review of all the cases. And we've heard at least one of those cases has subsequently been allowed. Um, the Director General today said something along the lines of, well, yes, they applied the criteria correctly, but now we're applying the judges ruling and we're going to go back and review all of those things. Should we be comforted by the fact we're now doing that review, Eddie? Uh, I don't think that the, the way the Director General uh, put this uh, is particularly helpful in the sense that the way our legal system works is the law is what a judge says it is, not what the government official says it is after a judge has ruled on the matter. Um, but in terms of there being a review, I think that's a really good example of the power of judicial review as an accountability mechanism uh, in that this only directly affected Mr. Christensen and his family. Um, but the result of this, of, of the judge saying, you got this wrong government, is all these other cases being reviewed and other people having uh, access to their families in a way that they probably should have from the start. But that's sort of the positive side of judicial review, that the not quite negative side, but the limit of it is an accountability mechanism. Um, Mr. Christensen's father happened to be an associate high court judge. Um, he was on the bench. He was in the judiciary. I suspect the family uh, knew the legal system pretty well. Um, and Mr. Christensen was the 24th or 20, 23rd person to, to have this restriction applied to him and the first person to successfully challenge it. And if it takes um, being a family this familiar with the, the judicial system, probably knowing a bunch of high profile lawyers willing to represent you, um, then that's a limit on judicial review, that it isn't available equally to all these other people who were in a similar situation to Mr. Christensen. Yeah, now just for myself, we've got to move on, talk about some criminal stuff, but just what I thought was really interesting about different modes of thought involved, because one of the things I always try and tell people that lawyers bring to processes and even policy processes is a focus on individual facts. Whereas often my experience of professional, other professionals, not that they're not capable and intelligent and empathetic as the, as the Director General said, but often the way they deal with facts is somewhat differently. Lawyers often like to hone in on particular things. And I think that 
the particular justice of the particular case. We're very good at arguing about those things. When I think that some other professions, not that they ignore those things, but they think about those individual circumstances in slightly different ways. And I just wonder whether there was some of that going on in this case with public health professionals maybe having a particular view of things shaped by their professional training, which is very different from the view of things that we have as our, with our professional training. But we've got to move on because we've been talking for a long time about court action. And Ness has been waiting to give us a weekly update on um, police data, which I've been, one of the things I've now learned through this whole process, how much police data there is. Um, there's some incomplete data at the moment, but you want to give us basically a bit of an update of whether to, what the data is telling us, what data we have, what data we don't have, what we're being told by the data. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, and it's great to see that there's actually some other people interested in the monthly police data figures, because usually I'm on my own in that regard. Um, so it's also really good to have Yvette joining us tonight to, to um, have some more criminal justice discussion. So um, I'll just have a, a brief update on what's been happening in enforcement. Um, so obviously this is a fundamental part of these orders that we've been talking about the, the process and the validity of. Um, so we've seen some similar trends in prosecution and warnings um, that they're very much being taken under the Health Act, which is obviously of interest in following these judicial review proceedings rather than the um, emergency, the civil defense emergency legislation. So we did get some uh, more regional variation uh, data out of a media article which showed, um, particularly in the first few days of level three, that prosecutions outweighed warnings, for instance, in the Wellington region, which suggests that escalation procedure that people were warned under level four, obviously did another breach and were then prosecuted. Um, but I really wanted to raise some points about accountability um, this evening. So we've been seeing some really good regular release of the raw numbers um, and obviously some regional variation, as I mentioned, but the missing piece really has been ethnicity. And um, there's a really high degree of public interest in this because uh, we know that, um, I mean, it's common knowledge that certain groups, particularly Maori, are overrepresented in criminal justice processes. Um, this was something that particularly came out of the HAPITIA reform consultation process last year. Um, so Dean and I um, had both been making inquiries of the police media team um, to, to push on this point of why ethnicity data was not being released. Um, so we know that this is definitely collected um, because the regular police um, data release, which happens at the end of the month, um, can, there are a number of ways you can cut the data. Ethnicity is one of those. Um, so we got a release of the whole of the March data um, and I pushed a little bit on getting an ethnicity breakdown on that. And again, that's material that has been collected and has been made available. And so both Dean and I in separate inquiries were, were pushed back for an OIA. Um, and obviously there's a bit of a delay on that at the moment. So look, we have to take people on, on their word that it does take a while to collate these, but um, it is my honest belief that the same system uh, out of which we can get the regular numbers and the regional variations also contains the ethnicity data. Um, so I think the police, I, I guarantee in, with a reasonable amount of effort over a couple of days, we could get some numbers on that. Um, and I think there's a really strong interest in accountability for these unprecedented powers. Um, so looking at other accountability mechanisms, we've seen um, some reports from the United Kingdom that the Crown Prosecution Service, um, that senior lawyers are going through the circumstances of every prosecution, and um, that could be another review mechanism. Um, we will also hope that we see some accountability after the fact, and um, so I would really hope and expect that we get some really good breakdowns of how these powers were used, if and when we transition out to, to a, a camera environment. Um, so obviously uh, something that we will be looking at in terms of the convictions is the result of this judicial review, the, the Borrowdale process. Um, so we've seen in other jurisdictions, for instance, a case that was heard um, on Tuesday in the Irish High Court, uh, two journalists taking a judicial review of the constitutionality of the emergency powers legislation there, which will mean if it's found to be unconstitutional that those convictions and arrests and other police interventions will not be valid. So um, something we'll be keeping an eye on is um, the results of the judicial review here and whether there's any implication for the, the safety of those convictions and other interventions. Yeah, and I think we, we were sort of tossing that around in another forum today about what happens 
the collateral consequences of the Baradale, the Baradale action? What consequences for people? Will people be able to take damages actions in civil court as a result of being locked up or of their businesses being affected? Um, that's probably time for another thing, but I think this criminal context is actually a really important one. Just give some context to some of the things that we've been seeing about this week in, in our world. We all, I think on this broadcast, we're aware of a terrible situation in Auckland where an Auckland law student was moved on by police from sitting outside a, a public library in Auckland. And the reason she was sitting outside the public library was because she was trying to use the Wi-Fi to connect to her law classes. And I think the implication of this tweet was that that's the reality of some of the inequalities that the lockdown has forced people. And I don't know whether what the circumstances were behind the, the police constables who decided that this was a someone who should just move on. And they apparently were a little bit scathing of her explanation. But it'd be interesting to know how that's been replicated across the whole of the New Zealand police force. Obviously, don't judge the police force by one particular incident outside an Auckland, Auckland library, but we we're interested to see those things. The other thing, the reason we've got a vet on is that a vet, I'm supposed to say she has expertise in juries, but in fact, a vet is actually a bit of a world expert in juries. And so we've been debating um, what it all means for jury trials, because some of us are vaguely aware that there are juries um, and that they have various legal things that they need to get on with. But a vet studied them in detail. And I thought we'd just get you on just to talk a little bit about what's going to happen next, because we just don't know when jury trials are really going to start up again. Um, and at what level and how you get people to turn up even for jury muster at this stage. Um, so did you want to start off yeah. with me? You know far more about juries than I do. Yeah, and I mean, and I'll pick up on your digital exclusion kind of point as well, that, you know, the, the very people who are underrepresented on juries are the ones that we're seeing are digitally excluded. And that does affect some of the solutions we might look at. Um, just to pick up on Nessa's point from, from last week about the importance of this delay in jury trials and stopping jury trials until at least the 31st of July, um, that's a real danger for a number of reasons around rights and delay. Um, not to go into that in too much detail, but you know, for category three that involves serious offences like sexual violation, we're going to see some pressure, I think, on defendants to opt for judge alone trial rather than electing trial by jury in order to get their cases heard more quickly to avoid as much delay. Um, and that kind of pressure means that it lacks transparency when they're making those kinds of decisions. And for the category four people, so things like murder and manslaughter, where they cannot have any other trial other than a jury trial, a lot of those people are at the moment remanded in custody. And so we're talking about an already systemic problem of delay being exacerbated. So it really is quite an urgent issue around when we can get jury trials started again. It's a major rights issue, but it's not one that's very easy to address. So I've been doing some thinking about, well, what could we do to get them started again? Um, the most obvious option is to have more judge alone trials. Um, at the moment in New Zealand, we don't have any general ability for the judge um, in those cases where the, the, the defendant can elect trial by jury to say, you cannot have one. Um, Nessa talked last week about some very um, slim, um, specific exceptions to that. But generally, if there's an election for trial by jury two years or more, then we can't have judges coming in and saying you can't have a jury trial. Just, just to, to clarify a bit, because some, some people might be aware that in other countries that do have judge trials, they have more than one judge. So a judge alone yes. trial in New Zealand is literally a judge alone. There will be one judge. Who one will judge. One judge, yes. And that's, um, and we're talking about election here for anyone who's the maximum penalty for their offence is two years or more. And there's a right to that um, in the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act and replicated in the Criminal Procedure Act. So one option is to say, well, we've already had a shift up to two years um, where that right kicks in. We could say we're going to move that to five years or seven years for the just the most serious category three and then category four offences. Um, or we could go for something even more radical and say, well, which is something that's being debated in England and Wales, which is to say we should in these emergency times allow judge alone trials and, in and every seems, case, and even where different. the defendant doesn't want it. And some very senior law official law figures, quite some quite senior former judges 
That's are beginning right. to advocate for that, which is interesting because one of the hallmarks mm. of English just, justice has always been the centrality of the jury system. And Englishmen, English women can't be put in jail without a jury. And suddenly these very, very senior figures I think worried about some of the stuff you were talking about are beginning to argue, we just have to pull the pin on this. Yeah, and there is a real danger in that because um, whatever we think um, around the rights or wrongs of jury trials, they are an important symbol of due process rights in the criminal process. There's a danger that if we make some of those changes in an emergency situation, then without having the appropriate debate about whether judge alone is the right replacement or whether it should be something else, we might end up actually just letting that flow on um, and losing one of our rights with, without actually debating that in a proper way. And I think that's one of the concerns that Ness has raised about some of the special courts that were instituted in yeah. Ireland or Northern that's Ireland right. in relation to the Troubles. And that's a big part of the debate in England and Wales at the moment is turning to look at those trials and what happened there and, and to really be thinking about, well, do we want that to be happening as, as an on the regular? Um, and I think we have to remember that juries, although they're only in a small amount of our criminal trials, it is important for community participation, for the education of people about the criminal process. So just moving to this option, the, what seems like an easy option of expanding judge alone trials actually could be quite a dangerous route for us to go down. So what I've been trying to do is think of a, a few more kind of short to medium term solutions or ways in which we can get a few more jury trials up and running. And a number of those relate directly to delay. Some of them relate a bit more to, well, how can we actually get people wanting to be on a jury when actually they've had lockdown and they're in a financially difficult position and then suddenly we're asking them to have two weeks or more out of their jobs and their lives again to come and do jury service. So one of the things I think would be relatively easy to do um, and would address this problem that we've got of lots of people turning up for court for balloting and jury selection would be to do some pre-trial balloting online. So that initial pre-trial ballot is a purely random thing. Um, we could actually set up a mechanism to do that online with some other focus around people who are having language issues who will be able to then put their hand up around that, um, which is normally what's done in the court at that pre-trial ballot stage. That would really cut down hugely on the number of people who are having to gather for jury selection in our and what about doing it, um, even more radically doing virtual <coughs> trials not having jurors in the courtroom with the, with the, the defendant and yeah. the complaining yeah and there are there are a couple of ways that might happen so so one is that we could say well we just have um a change of venue um so part of the problem is that in terms of physical distancing our courtrooms often are not suited to having physical distancing and keeping open justice and being able to have appropriate distance between jurors. But not only that, a lot of jury rooms where juries deliberate are small um, and they would not allow for physical distancing. So one option is to say, well, um, if university lecture theatres, for example, um, remain unused, they could become courtrooms or we could utilise Marai more. So large community venues um, is one option. Um, or we could say, well, we're going to utilise the normal courtroom, but then have the jury via remote link sitting together, physically distanced in a different room. Or we can go to what I think you might have been referring to, Jeff, which are completely virtual jury trials. And there is um, some mock jury research going on um, at the moment um, by Justice in England and Wales. Um, and they're looking at the possibility of how that might work. So that's where jurors stay home and they all zoom in um, from home. Um, so is this a good uh, thing? Like, it just seems to me that this is, you know, we all know in our own lives how problematic these kind of communications actually are, that we'd all much rather be in a room discussing these things because it's just yeah. easy as a human being to figure out other people. So we've grown up. Do we know much about how people respond in a criminal decision making to AVL and to other kinds of um, digital communications? Is it, do we know basically reaches the same results or quite different results? We really need a lot more research and I think we need some New Zealand specific research too. Um, so this is really in its infancy around how we're looking at that kind of research. A lot of the research has been about 
when witnesses come in remotely as opposed to what happens for jurors when they can't be in the same space. But we do know generally that that kind of remote participation without being in the same room does create a sense of disconnect. We all know that from the kinds of work that we've been doing through Zoom, that it is quite exhausting. Um, but there are some really big problems, I think, with that around the point that you were making around digital exclusion, because the very people who are underrepresented on juries are the, often the people who are overrepresented in the criminal process, Māori, Pacifica, and low socioeconomic groups, and they're the ones that are likely to be excluded from being able to have the appropriate technology to actually be a juror. So even before we get to the, you know, what's the quality of deliberations, we've got a real representation problem and issue. So given that we don't know all this stuff, is this actually a realistic option? I don't think that at the moment for us, that's a realistic option, but I think that's a long-term thing that we might look at in terms of, you know, can we do some more research on that? Is that something that if we do hit these roadblocks can actually be something that we could set up for a shorter term. So I think it's something that's interesting, but, and there are some positives in that, you know, the jury is saying, well, we can see better than we can in a courtroom. We can see everyone and what they're doing, but there are those representation problems and also issues around integrity and security we'd need to get on top of. So there's just too much research to do first before we can say that's really the viable option. I think a more viable option might be different venues or remote links where the jury is in, in a different venue to the trial um, rather than going full on virtual jury trial. So thanks, Yvette. I think it's great to have you along. We've probably gone a bit, I'm not sure there's anybody still out there listening or watching, but just to finish up, um, what I thought we'd just do is just get everybody to go around the panel and just ask what we're all watching for for next week. Um, do you want to start off, Dean? The, the, the Wi-Fi might be a bit scratchy here and the, the mighty pouring in our valley where I'm at, uh, uh, sitting under an extended double arrangement with my father on the farm. What we're looking for, what I'm looking at my eye next week. Sorry, I'm going to just stop Dean. He seems to basically, his outdoor location in a rural, pump, rural manner with two location is not working for the purposes of our Zooming at the moment. So Eddie, what are you looking for next week? So it's sort of a, a continuation of one of the things I've been looking at this week, which is the um, how the House um, Parliament being back is working and um, uh, not so well <laughs> this week. Um, we had uh, an omnibus piece of, of legislation come in to deal with a bunch of financial matters for um, COVID-19 related things. Uh, it was passed in under two hours. Um, it was the wrong piece of legislation that was tabled and they passed things that they had meant to pass later, oops, uh, and then explained them by a press release after it had been passed. Like, obviously this is very poor legislative practice and I hope we don't see it in the future. Um, we should have some select committee scrutiny. I see that there are two other pieces of um, omnibus legislation uh, that have come through one on immigration and allowing visas to be extended, et cetera, without the normal legal uh, restrictions uh, and a lot of other regulatory changes. Those have gone to select committee, not for long, but we've all got a week to comment on those next week. Um, so well worth doing, that's gone to the Epidemic Response Committee. Um, and the other thing I'll be watching is that Epidemic Response Committee. It's, um, I think, did a really, really good job as a, as a miniature parliament for the first two or three weeks of lockdown. Uh, over the past couple of weeks, it's been getting um, more like things were before the lockdown. And in a way, that's good. We're going back to our normal ways. Um, but in a way, it's bad because it's partisan um, bickering and I thought some quite inappropriate badgering of uh, some witnesses from the chair uh, this week. Um, I, it wasn't great to see. Um, but now it looks like it's actually having some legislation to look at. We'll have a look at how it does that next week and hopefully it gets back to the constructive uh, method it was acting in uh, earlier on. And Claudia, what are you thinking of for next week? Yeah, so I just, there's a little message came up from Dean 
um, candles will be burning late at PCO on New Ledger. Yeah, I, we, I, I expect next week we're going to see Level 2 legislation, some legislation to put um, Level 2 and give a legal framework for Level 2. And if they do put in legislation for Level 2, they may well, we may well see some kind of um, attempt to head off this litigation about Levels 3 and 4, some kind of retrospective um, validity of some kind. So that's what I'm particularly watching out for, and I'm also just fascinated to see um, what happens about the summons to the Solicitor General. And Nessa? Uh, I think I'm going to be really watching that idea of um, any effect of the judicial review on convictions, um, obviously in parallel with following the Irish High Court constitutionality point. Um, so from a purely personal uh, perspective with a, a partner whose business is can only start out under level two, I think I'm going to be moving my enforcement maybe a bit from the police um, to the health and safety, because I think that's what a lot of these workplace rules, um, obviously there'll be some police enforcement powers probably for the large gatherings, et cetera, but we're going to move more from that police power probably to more that regulatory um, work safe, health and safety type legislation. But I think there will still be some significant police powers um, that will be available to be exercised. So I'll be certainly like others looking at the design of those rules. Yeah. And lastly, Yvette? Um, Like Nessa, I will be closely watching those enforcement rules. And I think the police enforcement is going to be interesting around larger gatherings, um, particularly as that's going to be the younger demographic potentially that's, that's going to be affected by that. Um, and also looking at how the courts are going as they get moving up into more remote participation stuff. Um, I'm really interested around how that's going to start getting improved, hopefully, um, as we're moving through into level two. Yeah, so I'm, I think it's all very interesting stuff. Personally, I'm fascinated, like Claudia, about the legal privilege issue and the Crown Law Advice, what happens when select committee. Um, that's something I've been long interested in is should the Crown, and to what extent should the Crown claim privilege? I think sometimes the Crown does itself a disservice by not giving out some of its legal advice or because the Solicitor General has a very important role in New Zealand to declare really what is lawful in many respects. On the other hand, the Crown Law Office clearly has a role in giving strategic advice to the government. And we really want all governments, including a future national government, to rely on that strategic advice of the wisdom of the people who are at Crown Law, not just to say what's lawful, but also perhaps what ought to be done, um, which is a really important craft of those Crown lawyers. And the other thing is that legislative geek about me is really interested in how you go about drafting all of this stuff. And I think the last thing I'd be interested in not that I'll be attending any of these student parties, but exactly how the police is going to figure out how many people are actually at these parties, because that's always been a great mystery to me. What looks like a gathering of five people can in fact be 500 um, very quickly. And these are like a moving swarm. When do you judge the gathering at, at the beginning, at the end, in the middle? It's going to be very interesting to see how that works out. But I just wanted to thank everybody for contributing. Um, Dean um, is apologising. Um, profusely for the lack of equality. He's suggesting he's going to be writing a, a letter to Mr. Shane Jones to make sure that um, his particular part of the manor were to get a shovel-ready internet project tomorrow so we don't have these problems in the future. Um, or he just has to return back to good old Wellington. But thanks everybody. Thanks particularly to Vet and Claudia for joining us. Hopefully they'll come back again and I'm sure there'll be plenty to comment on on both the jury's issue and on the judicial review challenge issue um, as the thing goes forward. But thanks, everybody. Um, thanks for listening. Any comments, please send them in. Cheers. Bye.